Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to my presentation. Um, this time I will present only because uh, Nian Zhan uh, is a little bit sick and he had also two days ago actually his presentation at the GSF workshop. So I will do it today. Yeah. So the paper that I would like to present today is entitled Blockchain Consensus Protocols, Energy Consumption and Cryptocurrency Prices. So what's going on here in this paper? So the mining of cryptocurrencies or the maintenance of cryptocurrencies is energy consuming. It's an energy consuming process. For instance, Bitcoin, which is the first cryptocurrency that has been launched in the market already in, back in 2008, is based upon the so-called proof of work consensus protocol, which is a high energy cons consuming process where the miners are basically com competing with their computational power for basically verifying transactions in blocks and added to the blockchain. So it's a high energy consuming process. A recent research shows that over the year, if you thought or if you consider Bitcoin as a country, as a single country, it consumes as much energy as a whole nation like Hungary, which you see here on that, on that graph, which corresponds to 38 terawatt hours a year. Yeah. So how much is that in terms of money? Because we're in finance here, right? So it's uh, one, one kilowatt hour is about, let's say, 0 0.4, 0 0.4 euro or 40 cent. So 38 terawatt hours a year corresponds to about 15.2 billion euro per year, yeah, which is a huge amount of money just for the maintenance of this cryptocurrency, of one cryptocurrency. Yeah? And now think about it, we have, about more, we have more, more than 2,000 cryptocurrencies in the market. So the amount of money is overwhelming that's going on here. So, but there are also other cryptocurrencies. Yeah? One cryptocurrency that people talk a lot about is Ethereum. So the energy consumption of, of Ethereum, which uses actually the same consensus protocol as Bitcoin, proof of work, is much less. But in, in this graph here, it shows how much kilowatt hours are used per transaction. But compared to Visa, which consumes only 0.01 kilowatt hours per transaction, Ethereum uses still much, much more, even if it's not that energy consuming as Bitcoin. But if, and if you now want to know how many average transactions are used in Bitcoin, yeah, you just have to divide uh, 38,000 million or 38 uh, billion by 200, then you get the average transactions of Bitcoin per year. So, We can sort certain cryptocurrencies in certain groups based upon their energy consumption. So I was, I was talking about this proof of work consensus protocol, which is the highest energy consuming mechanism, yeah? where people, where the miners compete, yeah? and which is much, which consumes a lot of energy. But there are also proof, of, there's another consensus protocol, which is referred to as proof of stake. Yeah? This is the lowest energy consuming consensus protocol, yeah, where basically the miners get rewarded in terms of the fraction of the stake also on, based upon the coins that they own from this respective cryptocurrency. Yeah, so while proof of work is the most energy consuming cryptocurrency or consensus protocol, proof of stake is the lowest energy consuming consensus protocol, we have also hybrid coins, which is, which is a combination of proof of work and proof of stake consensus protocol, which is medium energy consuming. So we can basically cluster cryptocurrencies based upon the energy con con consumption in these three groups, in high energy consuming, medium energy consuming, and low energy consuming group. Yeah? So, there is some literature that argues that economic factors, like in this case energy, has an impact of the pricing of the cryptocurrency. For instance, we have this paper from Hayes, the 2017 paper, arguing that in an economy, the cost of production plays an important role to determine the market price. We have a paper from Li and Wang, also from 2017, 
arguing that economic factors drive the long-run price dynamics of cryptocurrencies. So there's one strand of literature that argues that fundamental factors actually drive the pricing of the cryptocurrencies. But there's also an, another stream of literature. For instance, this one paper from BSR from 2018 arguing that economic fundamental factors, which are in this case energy, do not have an impact on the pricing of the cryptocurrency. Yeah? They argue more that the price fluctuations of the cryptocurrencies actually stem from noisy changes in the trust system. Yeah? So the trust as the driving force for the pricing of the cryptocurrency. Yeah? So there are two different streams of literature. There's other, other relevant literature. Yeah? For instance, the paper from Li et al. from 2019 they are, cons they are considering Monero as a single cryptocurrency and uh, the electricity consumption of this, mon of this Monero mining and they conclude that the mining efficiency largely depends on the hashing algorithms rather than the consensus mechanism. And there's another paper that, that I have referred here is from Sumitsky and Kalvatsis from 2018 paper. They analyze spillover effects between Bitcoin, energy, and technology companies, and they find evidence for short-run volatility spillover from technology stocks to Bitcoin, whereas the long-run volatility spills over from energy stocks to Bitcoin. And one more word about trust. So this proof of work consensus protocol, as I already mentioned, is based upon competition. So if, if you have 51% of the computational power in the system, you have the possibility to manipulate the cryptocurrency, to manipulate the price. You can block transactions from the blockchain. If we consider proof of stake consensus protocol, if you own more than 51% of the fraction of coins in that cryptocurrency, you have also the possibility to influence the pricing. So is, is that trustworthy? That's much more difficult for hybrid coins yeah? because they are based upon, let's say, cooperative competition. If we consider proof of work as competition, proof of stake as cooperation, then we have hybrid coins as sort of cooperative competition, which is much more difficult for some party to influence the uh, pricing. So how do we contribute to this literature? So first of all, while most other papers are focused on one single currency, we use a portfolio view point of view. Yeah? We follow the standard literature from Pharma and French yeah, and do portfolio analysis. By this, we even out all the ideas and credit components that might have an effect on our analysis. Yeah? So we consider the portfolio, a portfolio of cryptocurrencies. Yeah? So we, secondly, we test whether differences in energy consumption is cross-sectionally reflected in differences in expected returns across cryptocurrency portfolios, sorted by energy consumption. What would you expect, expect from, if you apply basic finance theory to that data? If you have cryptocurrencies that have a where the uh, mining process is high energy consuming and on the other hand cryptocurrencies that are low energy consuming. Which of those is more risky to price changes in energy? So from a finance point of view, yeah, you would only keep more risky assets in your portfolio if the expected return is higher. Exactly. Yeah? So you would expect from a finance point of view that those cryptocurrencies that have this proof of work consensus protocol, that they have a higher average return than those cryptocurrencies that have proof of stake or hybrid consensus protocol, right? This is what we test. Furthermore, we use these three portfolios sorted by energy consumption and do statistical analysis. We want to see, is there return predictability on a portfolio level? using weekly data. And of course, if we again apply basic finance theory, if the market is efficient, what would you expect? You would expect 
that the return generating process does not exhibit any patterns of autocorrelation, right? So whenever autocorrelation in the data is present, the theory of market efficiency is violated. And also there, there are, there are streams of literature, recent streams of literature, that are arguing that the new cryptocurrency markets are more efficient than standard or than, than traditional asset markets, whereas other literature says, no, they are less efficient. So there's also no consensus achieved yet. And finally, we add to the momentum literature, but in contrast to standard analysis that uses a one, uh, monthly data, we use weekly data. So what data do we use? So for each of these three energy groups, proof of work consensus protocol, hybrid consensus protocol, and proof of stake consensus protocol, we download the 20 cryptocurrencies that have the highest market capitalization. We use weekly data from January 2016, three years ahead. So 156 weekly observations. We also consider a sample that excludes Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Ethereum due to their overall market capitalization so that we have roughly, to, to, so that we have three samples that roughly have the same market capitalization so that no one can argue that, that the size effect might drive our results. And also, we report our results for standard data, untrimmed, and also for trimmed data, where we exclude the left and right hand, right hand tail outliers from the distribution. And this is our data set here. These are the 20 cryptocurrencies for each of our portfolio groups. Yeah? And as I told you already, the first three in one sample we exclude from the data. Yeah? Excluding those three, we have uh, overall market cap of 38% for these proof of work coins, 31% for hybrid coins, and 30%, roughly 30% for proof of stake. So it's roughly similar market capitalization in our three portfolio groups. What methodologies do we use? As I already told you, we use a simple t-test, yeah, the cross-sectional t-test yeah, of our portfolios in order to test if there's a difference in average return. Very simple methodology for figuring out or for analyzing the statistical uh, properties. We use simple autoregressive models yeah, where we use the uh, standard archaic uh, criterion, if I remember correctly, for determining the optimal lag length. And we also use the whole battery of LM tests in order to check if there has remained any remaining uh, outcorrelation in the residual processes. Yeah. Then we use time series momentum, like this formula from Moskowitz, yeah, standard time series momentum. So we invest in, in the overall universe of cryptocurrencies, yeah, and we are long on those assets, on those cryptocurrencies that have a positive return and we are short on those assets that have a cumulative negative return over the past K weeks. Yeah? And again, we use different, different uh, uh, weeks or lag weeks where we base our momentum thoughts on. And I don't know why the last line here is not, it's, it's usually, I think that, that this, uh, this PowerPoint doesn't like formulas and so somehow always when I send to myself the PowerPoint presentation, then somehow those slides where formulas, somehow some things disappear all of a sudden, who knows. So, so what do we find? Yeah? What you see here in this graph yeah, is the time series evolution of the cumulative returns for our three portfolio groups and also for the proof of work uh, group excluding those three largest cryptocurrencies. Yeah? And what you see is that the, that the return patterns or the, or the cumulative return patterns of this uh, proof of stake and proof of work groups are, is very similar. Huh? There's no big, big spread in the data. But for the hybrid coins, you see that, that there's a time series spread. Huh? So the hybrid coins somehow are drifting away. Huh? Now already you, you can see from just vis visualizing here what's going on that that there's a difference in return, must be a difference in average returns, right? If you compare the hybrid cryptocurrency portfolio with proof of stake or proof of work cryptocurrency portfolios. But we need figures, right? 
So what we see here is the, the table of descriptive statistics for our portfolio groups, yeah? having the proof of work, consensus protocol group, then here, here the same, excluding the largest three cryptocurrencies, yeah? just for checking the robustness. And we have here the portfolio of hybrid coins and proof of stake. What we see is that the average mean, and this is in terms of per week, yeah? is very similar for proof of work, proof of work excluding Litecoin, Bitcoin, and Ethereum, and proof of stake. Yeah? The difference, there no, is less than 1% difference here. But for hybrid coins, it's 13.6% per week. Yeah? So much, much higher com compared to all the other portfolios. And what we do next is a t-test. Yeah? We are testing different portfolios, zero-cost portfolios. Yeah? We, we test the average return of proof of work group minus proof of stake group, then the average return of proof of work group excluding the big three minus proof of stake. We have a portfolio proof of work minus hybrid, and we have hybrid minus POS, proof of stake. So if finance theory holds and energy matters for the pricing, yeah, what we would expect is that the first guy here, proof of work minus proof of stake, that the average returns are positive, right? Because we know already that proof of work cryptocurrencies uh, consume much more energy than proof of stake cryptocurrencies. But what we find is that the T statistic indicates that it's insignificant. But what we find is that hybrid coins generate significantly higher returns than either proof of work or proof of stake portfolio. Yeah, and the return difference, for instance, here, what we report here, the return difference between hybrid portfolio and the proof of stake portfolio is 8.58% per week. The statistic of 2.5 indicating significance on a 5% level. <coughs> and for the other figure, you just have to revert it. Yeah, proof hybrid coins minus proof of work portfolio would be then 9.12 with the statistic of 2.76, of which indicates significance on even a 1% level. So what do we do next? So we use our portfolios and we regress it on its lagged own values. Yeah? We have here our groups. Yeah? First group is, is the portfolio of cryptocurrencies having proof of work consensus protocol. Then we have here the second group where we exclude the big three. Then we have the portfolio of cryptocurrencies based upon hybrid consensus protocol. And last but not least, proof of stake consensus protocol. And what we find is applying the standard Aikaiki information criterion, the optimal lag order for proof of work portfolio yeah, is three. So we have to face higher order autocorrelation. Yeah. Second and third log uh, and third lag are significant on at least the 5% level. Having hybrid coins, the optimal lag order is 2. Now, t statistic is 2.76, significance on a 1% level. Having proof of stake coins, yeah, this portfolio has even higher order autocorrelation. Even the fifth leg is significant on a 5% level. What does that mean? And another question, if we consider the, station, the stability condition for autoregressive processes, are the processes stable? Yes, they are. Because the sum of the significant parameter estimate is less than one. So all of the processes exhibit stability. So, Obviously, since the, the lags where they predict future returns here, we have predictability. And in turn, is the market efficient or not efficient? Is anyone an opinion? Is anyone here from finance? <laughs> so obviously, the market, based upon these results, is not efficient. Yeah? Because you can predict future returns by the lags. What else does this imply in terms of momentum? If we think now momentum thoughts, 
Yeah? So return predictability means we can form momentum portfolios. Because obviously, if you accumulate, all these all this point estimates are positive. Yeah? So there's positive autocorrelation going on. Which means that the cumulative returns have predictive power. So next, we implement momentum sort. So, so why the first lap is weak? It's strong. Yes. Yeah, because we are not we are here in digital financial markets and somehow they are differently. So obviously first order autocollation doesn't matter, irrespective of which portfolio here we consider. It's only the second leg which is basically in common. That's the commonality here. So two weeks or the second week, yeah. Second week. Yeah. If you are now a week minus two, if the return in week minus two is high, it's more likely that the return now is also high. Yeah. Odd. It's odd. Do you, do you think about stock index returns and look at the autocorrelations? They are, they are autocorrelated. That's from an observation. Here you construct portfolios, so you have indexes in a way. And so is it the same thing here? here? How do you mean? How are the individual components of, of, of individual components of the portfolios? Are they? We have not considered any individual com components here because we want to make more, we want to make stronger assumptions about the market. So, and the individual components are noisy, very noisy, as we, as we have seen or as we know actually. So, we just do portfolio analysis here. So, on an individual level, we what we would be supposed to do is actually farm and make, farm and make best regressions, right? Because, say, say we have 2,000 assets but we have only 156 observations, time series observations on the, in the time dimension, what we, would, what we actually would be supposed to do is running OLS regressions, uh, time series OLS regressions for each of these 2,000 cryptocurrencies, and then collect the beta estimates and do a second regression based upon the beta estimates, right? So that's, that's much more tricky. So if we, if we just want to make strong statements on the, in the time series, we have to form portfolios because we don't have enough observations in the time dimension. But can it cause autocorrelation, this construction of portfolios? Why? Because if you have so many things, all so many things in terms of the autocorrelation. Could be, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not into this stock in this, in this index uh, literature, but, but at least you see here higher autocorrelation auto on the weekly data. And this implies you can form momentum portfolios. And of course, you can also form momentum portfolios in using indices, of course. People do that. People do that. Did you try also other frequencies than weekly? Not, not in this paper. Here we, here we just focused on weekly data. In the previous paper, we investigated the monthly data, and there we didn't find any payoffs for momentum. But now, using weekly data, obviously there's something else going on. Here we have, uh, we use Newey West covariance matrix estimator accounting for five legs. So those point estimates are robust. One quick question. Uh, uh, are there any constants mean there is sort of some time trend, uh, time trend in the data? For example, does that hybrid mean every week on average 10% goes on its uh, it has a 10% return? That's basically the intercept of the autoregressive model. Yeah? And of course, there must be something. That there must be, there is a significant intercept because you see already, no, wait, we have now the wrong direction. And of course, it must be positive, right? Because here we know already that the sample mean is positive for all portfolios. Yeah? So that's basically the the intercept, the part that is unexplained by past movements in the price, in the, re in the return process. So we, we use, based upon this information, we use all these 60, we have 60 assets. Yeah? Each of these portfolio groups has uh, 20 cryptocurrencies and now we use, we put all them together in a universe of 60 cryptocurrencies yeah? having a high market capitalization, so controlling for liquidity by that and use it for momentum sorts, yeah? updated at the beginning of each week. So we use three different frequencies. So we use cumulative three weeks return, cumulative six weeks, nine weeks, and 12 weeks. Uh, and now I report in only the results based upon the trimmed data. Yeah? And in the, in the paper, you find the results also for the 
untrimmed data, which is very similar. But here now we exclude all the outliers from the left and right hand tile of, tile of the distribution. And what we see is that the momentum portfolios, yeah, using time series momentum, generate significant payoffs, yeah, irrespective of the, of, the, of the strategy, between 2.4 and 4% per week. Yeah. Self-financing zero-cost strategies. And the T statistic is significant even in, on even a 1% level. So, and this result is contrary to our earlier result. Yeah? In our earlier paper that we published, there we do not find any evidence for momentum. But there we use monthly data. And if you think about now, okay, obviously, obviously these cryptocurrencies, the return generating process is more of a short, short run memory process. Yeah? We operate with, if you operate with, with higher frequency data, there is obviously autocorrelation going on if we operate with low frequency data, like monthly returns or, or, or quarterly returns, there is no autocorrelation. So if you use the 12-month accumulation period, obviously it's poisoned. It's poisoned with redundant information, and, there, and therefore probably in the earlier paper we didn't find any, any results. Because we have, we have uh, polluted cumulative returns in forming the portfolios. But using weekly data in a relatively short time window for the, for, the, for the accumulation period, obviously we find significant returns, which again shows that the market efficiency hypothesis is violated. So, so now the question is, okay, what explains those momentum returns? So now recall the time series evolution of these cumulative returns for our portfolios here, for our proof of work portfolio, hybrid portfolio, and proof of stake portfolio. Yeah? We see a time trend here. And if we plot now the returns or the cumulative returns for our three or four momentum portfolios, we see that the time series evolutions are very similar. What we have not done in, in this paper here is the principal component analysis. But obviously, you see that the information I would guess, my guess is that if, I would write, if we would run a PCA on, on those four series, there's obviously one dominant factor. That obviously, that all of these strategies are driven by, by one common eigenvalue. Yeah? So, but that's maybe what we can do later on. But anyways, so the time series evolution of the cumulative random returns is very similar to what we see here. If you, if you compare the hybrid coins with the uh, the proof of stake or proof of work coin. So now the question arises, okay, to which extent can the momentum returns actually be explained by the difference between hybrid coins and let's say proof of stake or proof of work coins? So what we do now is we construct a zero cost portfolio, let, let's sort of an energy factor, yeah? a portfolio that is long, on, on hybrid coins and short on proof of stake coins. But of course, it doesn't matter. You can also use, you can also use proof of work or you can use the, the short lag, the short side based upon, you can put 0.5 of the, of the stock, you can open five short on POV and 0.5 short on POS. It doesn't matter, it doesn't really matter. What matters is the spread between hybrid and what is here going on. So we just form a portfolio, hybrid coins minus proof of stake have it, it's, and have it as a regressor and add a constant term. So, and if we have a regression model in a, in a time series framework and we use this energy factor, yeah, what we can see is, okay, to which extent is our zero cost momentum portfolio exposed to this energy factor and what's the remaining part? This is basically the risk adjusted return. Yeah, this, is, this, is, this is the part or the the part of the return process of our momentum portfolios that is unexplained by fluctuations in this energy factor here. So this is what comes out. Yeah? So here what we have here is on the left hand side our different momentum portfolios yeah, for the untrimmed and the trimmed data, doesn't matter. And here we have as a regressor, a single regressor, our energy factor. Yeah? which is simply the zero cost portfolio long on hybrid coins, short on proof of stake coins. Yeah? So we see positive exposure, T statistics between 10 and 29, You're highly significant on any level. So all of them are exposed to hybrid coins. So those momentum portfolios, 
Now, our long lag correlates positively with hybrid coins. So we invest in hybrid coins. Yeah, it's a hybrid coin strategy, basically. And the constants are insignificant. None of them exhibit uh, any, any real significance. So the whole payoff for our time series momentum strategy implemented in cryptocurrencies is obviously explained by exposure to hybrid coins. This is also a novel result. Yeah. So what can we conclude? So first, cryptocurrencies is hybrid consensus protocol generated during the sample period, which is from 2016 to 2018, considerably higher average returns than proof of work consensus protocol or proof of stake consensus protocol. That's novel finding. Second, energy sorted cryptocurrency portfolios exhibit strong patterns of higher order autocorrelation, yeah, which in turn shows that the cryptocurrency market is not efficient. Yeah. Using weekly data, we find evidence for time series momentum effects, which is contrary to our earlier paper yeah, because of the frequency, what we already saw. And last but not least, the momentum portfolio is highly exposed to cryptocurrencies that have hybrid consensus protocol. And now if we take, if we now go back to the trust issue, yeah, so what, what does that actually mean from a trust perspective? And we know that proof of work technology or that proof of work consensus protocol is pure competition. Yeah? Those, those miners who have the highest computational power, they get the piece of the cake basically. Yeah? So, so they, they get the reward. If we have a proof of stake consensus protocol, it's collaboration. So everybody gets, gets a certain predefined based upon the fraction of coins that you have in your pockets, a predefined piece of the cake. Yeah? It's cooperation or, or collaborative. And hybrid coins is cooperative competition. So it, it has two, both of these mechanisms combined. And obviously the demand or, the, or people somehow have a higher demand for cryptocurrencies that have hybrid consensus protocol. Uh, now, we, now we have to know that the, that the cryptocurrencies, uh, the supply side, is, it's, it's basically fixed for, for most of the cryptocurrencies. So the, the, the pricing depends basically on the, on, on the demand side. So and obviously for hybrid coins, the demand is much higher than for proof of work or proof of stake consensus protocol. So because people somehow consider those cryptocurrencies as more trustworthy. Yeah. Any questions? <laughs>